Welcome to the Young Turks. Jake, you're dead and Chris Perry is back. Casper is back. You know, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Casper, good to have you back. Thank you, it's great to be back. Um, great to dive into all of this super encouraging news. Oh yeah, you I know. know, and that- I mean, just story after story today. It's good a, news gushing yeah, out. Yeah, <laughs> and it all, as it often does. All right, uh, so uh, we, we've got unfortunate Trump news later in the show. We've got a segment called Battle of the Dumbest, you're gonna enjoy that. But first, we start with Democratic foils, if you will. Let's do it. All right. I'm very disappointed that we're not going with the original $3.5 trillion, which was very transformative. That was House Speaker Nancy Pelosi making concessions on the reconciliation bill to corrupt corporate Democrats in the Senate. Of course, in regard to the reconciliation bill that originally was supposed to be around Five to six trillion dollars. Progressives negotiated down to 3.5 trillion dollars. And now Pelosi during this press conference makes it abundantly clear that the final result of the bill, if it happens to pass, will be even less than the 3.5 trillion dollars. Which means that incredibly important provisions, popular provisions in that bill will likely get cut. Let's hear a little more of what she had to say. In the family section of it, the transformative nature of the Biden child tax credit, child care and um, universal pre-K really go together. That, that's sort of a, uh, they go together, they, they're part of the same, uh, meeting the same need. Uh, issues that relate to home health care. There's certain things that we, I mean, we're still talking about a couple trillion dollars, but it's not, you know, it's more, um, it's, much less. So mostly we would be cutting back on years and something like that. But those are decisions that we have to. Excuse me. Do you think would you have to drop one of those programs? Well, we hope not. We hope not. But we just we have to make sure we have a bill, which I also said is that we have to have something that will pass the House and pass the Senate. So of course she mentions that it needs to pass the House and pass the Senate because you have two, and of course very possibly more corporate Democrats in the Senate who are not in favor of the $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill because their corporate donors aren't in favor of the $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill. So they're really the ones that are holding this bill up and demanding cuts to it. Now, Pelosi mentioned it's still likely to be a couple trillion dollars. I'll tell you where she got that number from. But first, some more details in regard to the communication that Pelosi has had with members of Congress recently. In fact, just last night, in a letter to Democrats Monday night, Pelosi had suggested the cost cutting efforts would come in the form of eliminating some of the proposed benefit provisions altogether. She promoted the idea of putting the focus more squarely on child benefits and efforts to tackle climate change. So look, as you could tell from that answer she gave, she didn't really specify what would get cut from the legislation. But the fact that we're having this discussion in the first place is maddening, especially when you consider that every single provision in that bill, universal child care, mandatory paid family leave, two years free community college. These are things that poll incredibly well. These are things that constituents of both Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin overwhelmingly support, but they don't care. Because the donors desires speak louder to these lawmakers than what their own constituents want. So there's a couple of different issues here, but am I the only one who thinks that she sounds fairly incoherent? It's not that she sounds incoherent, it's that as Speaker of the House, she has difficulty speaking. I mean, she's constantly stuttering and, and can't get her point out clearly. And I think that is a problem because you need someone who can message what the bill includes and, and basically rally for it, like go out there and make a case for it. And honestly, Nancy Pelosi fails to do that. And she gets asked about that later and gets snippy with a reporter. I'll go to that in a minute, but Cenk, uh, yeah. what else do you think? So look, uh, I love the fact that you pointed out that speaker is in her title. Um, this is part of why Democrats don't do as well as Republicans. So you know, we make fun of Trump because he says absurd things, but a lot of people relate to him because he speaks like a normal person, um, and he he doesn't go into uh, climate change and child care uh, credit and uh, trillions, but less. Like, what was that? What the hell was that? 
And, and so if you don't have a person who can deliver a message clearly, well, then obviously you're not gonna do as well in politics. This, that's not hard to understand. And so, look, I, I don't wanna beat her up uh, I, I, if she was a normal person. Like, you know, she's, she's in her, I think she's in her 80s by now, but at least late 70s. And so, hey, I've got empathy for that. But wait, you're supposed to represent all Democrats. So this is not the role where you're like, oh, you know what? You're still hanging in there as a dentist in your late 70s, but you know, I appreciate what you're doing. No, this is not about appreciation. And the, and by the way, I can live with all that too. Well, I can't. You really need an effective communicator in that role. But on top of that, everybody in DC is like, she's the greatest. <laughs> no, no I can't live with the gaslighting. I can't live with it. No, you're forcing me to say she's incoherent. No one can understand what she's saying. She jumps from thought to thought, never finishes the sentences, let alone saying something like here, I'll give you an example. Let's say that I'm doing that press conference. We've got child tax credit in here. It is at 80% popularity. Why aren't we passing it? Why is every Republican against it? I want you to, all of you reporters out here, okay? Now I'm not telling you how to do your job, but I would imagine that you would normally ask a Republican, why are you against a program that 80 has 80% popularity, including the majority of Republican voters? Why are they against their own voters? Now what have you done? You, I mean, it's how long did that take? 15 seconds? You've now made the Republicans be on a massive defense. And you've also put the reporters on, on, on defense thinking, wait, have I not done my job? Have I not held the Republicans accountable? Now, of course, she would never do this, but if you actually wanted to get the bill passed, remember the Republicans are irrelevant. She would put Cinema and Mansion on blast. Oh my God, they're in my own party. I have to go. I protect them at all costs. No, you're supposed to protect us, the voters, at all costs. So if I was in her role, I would do I would do a real job. I would say, look, Cinema and Mansion are holding this up. Everybody knows it. They probably represent a couple more corporate Democrats in the Senate. Let's keep it real, right? And why are they doing what they're doing? Here, let me show you a donor of theirs. Boom, you put up the how much money that Manchin is getting from fossil fuel industry. You put up how much money Kristen Cinema just got from the drug companies for her role mm -hmm. in eviscerating the bill. And go now, that's why they're doing it. I but know, but Pelosi would be telling on herself. Because remember, while Pelosi is not very effective in terms of getting legislation passed. While Nancy Pelosi is not an effective communicator, one thing that she is effective on is raising money for the Democratic Party. That's the reason why you have Washington constantly fawning over her because she raises money. You think she's gonna call out those donors? No, of Get course not. Here. No, of course not, Anna. And so, but that's part of my point. Guys, why, don't let the media gaslight you. It is not normal for there to be this level of corruption and for the Speaker of the House to pretend to be in favor of a three and a half trillion dollar bill, but actually help gut it and cut it in nearly in half so that the corporate donors of other Democrats can get richer off of the US taxpayers. They make it, the national media in this country makes it seem like it's normal. Oh, of course, of course, and don't say the donors. Don't say the donors, pretend they have concerns about the voters, even though every poll shows that their own voters want it. They, they're gaslighting all of us, None of, it's all theater, just understand that. Now what's also uh, discouraging is the fact that President Joe Biden has already agreed to cutting the funding for that bill. So addressing House Democrats earlier this month, Biden suggested lawmakers should shoot for spending in the $2 trillion range instead. And so naturally, reporters who wanna ask decent questions wanna know, what do you plan on cutting from the bill? I have a prediction on what it'll be, but watch Speaker Pelosi get real snippy with a reporter who asked, I think, a logical question. Will it be the first to go to get the price of the package down? <laughs> you must be kidding. <laughs> That's a negotiation, that's not something that I would be announcing here and I don't even know what that would be. Uh, no, what would be the first go, but would be a, a, probably in timing, that the timing would be reduced in many cases to make the uh, cost lower. But it only would be in such a way that does not undermine the transformative nature of it because some of it has to have enough money in order to be have sustainability that is can be counted on. I mean, I don't even know what the last part of that answer was, but no, the reporter is not kidding. The reporter asked a logical question about what Democratic leadership proposes to cut from 
the reconciliation bill, responding with you must be kidding is ridiculous. And then the other part of it is, I won't be answering you know, that during this press conference. Then why are you doing a press conference? What do you think people wanna know about? I don't understand why you would hold a press conference if you're not gonna get specific about what's happening and what Democratic leadership proposes to do to get that reconciliation bill passed. And you know, my prediction, Jenk, is that since Pelosi has really used the child care provisions included in the reconciliation bill for her own, you know, branding and her attempts at building a legacy for herself. I think the first thing that's likely to go is the expansion of Medicare, including the negotiations for lowering drug prices under Medicare. I think I think that's going to I think they're going to do away with that, especially considering how powerful the healthcare and pharmaceutical lobby is. Yeah, so let me talk about one by one. Why do you do a press conference? We're not naive about it. It's not like a Democrat or Republican do a press conference because they believe in the freedom of the press and they wanna make sure the press gets to ask them tough questions. No, they do it to put out their own points and to emphasize things that they think will be helpful in the process. None of that was helpful. Yeah, so why didn't you do it? Like if you come out there and go, why'd you do the press conference? If you yell at the reporters for asking you perfectly logical questions, why'd you do the press conference? And so she said there, the timing would be reduced. I know what she's talking about, I don't know that any I don't know that any regular person watches a press conference like that. I, you know, <laughs> but if you did, I don't know that you would understand what the hell she's talking about. Mm-hmm. What, what she means is it's a 10 year timeline, but if we make it a six or seven year timeline, well then instead of costing three and a half trillion, it might cost around the two trillion that Joe Biden says now that he wants as a compromise. Um, but we would get to keep all the programs. You see how I just explained it really clearly in 10 seconds? She was, are we reduced the timing? But. We're not in your caucus. I mean, we understand it because it's our job to understand it. But the average American that you're trying to speak to does not understand it at all. Why are you doing the press conference if you're not trying to persuade voters to go in a certain direction or you're totally incapable of it? I know, by the way, any comment like this in DC would get us kicked out of whatever room we're in. They would say, how dare you say that about the Speaker of the House? We're not under any obligation to kiss the ass of the powerful. She's not good at this, certainly on the public speaking part. There's no question, you'd have to be blind, deaf and dumb to say she nailed it. My God, I came out of that press conference thinking, man, the Democrats position is so good. I can't wait to support them. Right. Okay, and then on the issue of taking questions or not, Other Democrats are beating up on cinema, rightfully so, for not answering the question of, well, okay, if you want the bill to be a lower number, what do you want to take out? That's a great question that other Democrats are pushing forward. Pelosi gets asked the same question, she's like, how dare you, you insubordinate reporter. Don't you know you work for me? Which then leads us to the next clip. The next clip is what really caught my attention because some recent polling indicates that the reconciliation bill as a whole isn't It's not that it doesn't poll well, it's that most Americans don't even know what's in it, right? If you take the provisions separately and poll Americans on it, the provisions are incredibly popular. So the reporter here is talking about a specific poll that shows that the majority of Americans don't even know what's in the reconciliation bill and asks, again, a logical, legitimate question. Watch how Pelosi handled the answer. Our latest CBS News poll shows that only about 10% of Americans describe themselves as knowing a lot of specific things that are in the reconciliation package and that the majority don't know anything at all. So do you think you need to do a better job at messaging and going forward, how do you sell this if ultimately you have to- Well, I think you all could do a better job of selling it, to be very frank with you, because every time I come here, I go through the list. Family and medical leave, climate, the, the issues that are in there. And, um, but it is true, it is hard to break through when you have such a comprehensive package. Uh, but uh, as we narrow it down and, and put it out there. There are two different types of media figures when it comes to news. You have straight news journalists who are just supposed to report the facts, and then you have People like us who, yes, we share the details of various stories with you, but then we share our analysis and opinion. It is not the job of the reporters who were there listening to that press conference to go out and do political activism on behalf of the Democratic Party. It's not their job. 
The Democrats have to sell the bill. And when you have a Speaker of the House who can't do public speaking, right? The most basic part of her job, you're gonna have some issues. And that's what the issue is here. Yeah, but it really betrays her sense of entitlement with the press. That to be fair to her, actually does exist. She assumes you guys all work for me. Every time Democratic leadership says something, mainstream media repeats it like it's true. So why haven't you sold it better for me? I told you to go sell it, and you haven't done your jobs. She, you know, upbraids them. It's and ridiculous. Because that's her baseline assumption. That's what's in her head. That's why she said it, and and that has been generally true. And so that it's our press sucks. They were fine in that press conference. They actually asked a couple of mildly challenging questions, <laughs> but but it, it it's. That thought to her is in her mind because that is how the press operated for the last 40 years. Now, then she says, look, every time I come out here, I go through the whole laundry list. No, you didn't, and you didn't do no. it there. And by the way, you don't have to go through the whole laundry list. It's a big uh, a bill, you don't have to get into provision number 37. Okay, here, again, we're always constructive in our critique. So here's what you could do instead. We're gonna provide childcare for you guys. It's got 80% popularity, who doesn't want it? Only 20% don't want it, I don't know why they don't want it, maybe they don't have kids. But everybody who's got kids loves this provision, even people who don't have kids love this provision. Well, you know what else we got in there? We're gonna lower drug prices. Who wants higher drug prices? Raise your hands if you want higher drug prices. And we're gonna do that because we're gonna hold those drug companies accountable to look out for you. Boom, I just listed the two most popular provisions, I can keep going, but that's enough. Then people love it because then they think it's about those two things. And they're in there, and they're huge parts of it. So why don't you just do that instead of the, the, the timing would be reduced, child tax, child welfare. She's paid not to, it's that simple, she's paid not to. Yeah, and well to that point, Anna, you said the first thing they're likely to take out is the Medicare provisions. Of course, why? The number one donors in Washington by a lot are drug companies. And so way more than oil companies, way more than banks. And so, and Pelosi has sent her chief of staff before to go tell the drug companies, don't worry, we're always on your side. Okay, that was reported by The Intercept a while back. Cinema takes money from them, Manchin takes money from them. And, and we know that that's the one that they're gonna take out. How do we know all these things in advance? We've told you 100 things by now. I even told you months ago that they were gonna land at around 2.1 trillion. Looks like they're gonna land at around 2.1 trillion. How do we know that? Because it's actually not that hard, it's not that complicated. All you gotta do is follow what they're saying based on what the donors have told them. But the media is like, I don't know, this is indecipherable. I can't figure it out. I don't know what's going on here. I can. It used to be a thing that journalists cared about. It was called follow the money. You follow the money and you find out how this stuff works. All right, well, one person who did follow the money is Jonathan Larson over at TYT Investigates, who has another bombshell to share with you today in regard to the National Prayer Breakfast. So we're gonna take a break and we'll come back with that story and more. See you then. All right, back on TYT, Cenk and Anna with you guys, go. Who funds the National Prayer Breakfast? This right wing group of people who have this annual prayer breakfast that unfortunately is also attended by some congressional Democrats and Democratic presidents. Well, Jonathan Larson over at TYT Investigates investigated this and found out that Franklin Graham is secretly bankrolling the National Prayer Breakfast. The son of Breakfast co founder Billy Graham, Franklin Graham, is openly anti-LGBTQ, anti-Islamic and partisan. He's also a source close to the family says, the only source of revenue for the National Prayer Breakfast aside from ticket sales. So why is he doing it? And more importantly, why is he bankrolling the National Prayer Breakfast secretly? That we don't know, you can only speculate, but Graham single-handedly enabled the family to keep its breakfast operations intact this year. Because the 2021 breakfast was remote due to COVID, the family had zero revenues from guest registration fees, which in some cases can be as much as $500 per person. Now, how does he carry out this funding? 
Well, he does it through two different organizations that he runs. Uh, two groups that Graham runs are uh, the Samaritan's Purse, one of the world's largest relief organizations, and the Billy Graham Evangel Evangelistic Association. Uh, Samaritan's Purse filings up through 2019 show repeated annual donations to the family. The family runs the National Prayer Breakfast, of course. Uh, the BGEA changed its legal status in 2014 calling itself a church and so it no longer has to disclose its filings. But previous records show that it too gave to the family. For years, the BGEA tax filings included $20,000 earmarked for the National Prayer Breakfast and report, reported that the organization attends the breakfast on behalf of the ministry. Samaritan's Purse gave the same amount annually, bumping it up to $25,000 in 2015. And then in 2016, doubling that amount to $50,000 which it has given every year since. Now, why is this a big deal? Why do we wanna know who's bankrolling the National Prayer Breakfast? Well, if you might have missed some of the previous reporting on this story, just know that the National Prayer Breakfast serves as an opportunity for both lobbyists and foreign figures to meet with congressional lawmakers and essentially go into these breakaway rooms after the breakfast to do lobbying that goes unnoticed because this is all kind of done in secret. And then there's also the fact that this organization goes to other countries essentially pushing for laws that would be incredibly harsh, incredibly cruel to various groups of people, including members of the LGBT community. In fact, Forbidden Colors, an LGBTQ advocate advocacy group warned congressional Democrats last month in an intelligence brief that their participation in prayer breakfasts lends credibility to far right movements. The European Parliamentary Forum on Sexual and Reproductive Rights reported this summer that right wing activists are staging prayer breakfasts to help expand their networks. So a good example is what they did in Uganda in essentially pushing for uh, the punishment of execution toward gay individuals in that country. So that's the kind of disgusting behavior they're taking part in. Why Democrats would want to be part of this um, is certainly questionable. Joe Biden just gave a speech at the National Prayer Breakfast. Uh, the Clintons have, uh, so they they are told, oh no, uh, you got to attend this, or maybe they love it. Uh, maybe maybe they look like the agenda that that is being pushed by these uh, guys, um, and. No Democrat should ever attend this. Once we put it to people like Ro Khanna and Ted Lieu and they found out what was happening, they're like, "Oh no, no, we don't want any part of that. And they're not going anymore. Um, so uh, it turns out Graham funds the whole thing, uh, plus the ticket sales, that's it. So, well, let me just tell you a little bit about Graham, okay? So number one, he said, uh, I think the president's, when to referring to Obama, I think the president's problem is that he was born a Muslim. Well, first of all, that's not true. Second of all, it's not a problem. He just, he just said, and he doesn't take it back at all. If you're born a Muslim, that's a problem. You're gonna go attend this event, financed by this monster. He then went on to say that he was concerned about President Obama because he was letting the Muslim Brotherhood infiltrate the US government. That's not only hateful, it's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. He's putting this prayer breakfast on as a show so that he can get idiot Democrats to show up, take pictures with them, and then he can go around going, "Oh no, even the Democrats support our agenda." So what else does he have on his agenda? Of course, he's against same-sex marriage. He says when Buttigieg was talking about how he was openly gay, he's like, "That's not anything to be proud of. It's a sin," and and he said it's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. um, now there is one public official that he was in favor of, other than of course Donald Trump, who he loved. Now Donald Trump has cheated on his wife. He's done all these terrible things. He's done the sexual assaults, etc. No, but no big deal. It's not like evangelicals like, care about yeah, that. Yeah, he's like right? family values. I mean, come on, they were porn stars. What was he going to do? Not have sex with them while his wife was delivering? Okay, come on, man. You you think these guys are moral in any way, shape, or form? This is a joke. By the way, he's pro-life and was a staunch advocate of the Iraq War that killed hundreds of thousands of civilians, including. A ton of children, children were killed, innocent children were massacred in Iraq, and Graham applauded, yeah! Hey, after all, they were born Muslim. I mean, he, he is pro-life though. Yeah, he's pro-life, pro -life. okay. <laughs> no, these guys are filled with hate. One last thing, I know you can go on for forever with, uh, uh, with Graham. Uh, so 
He's in favor of conversion therapy, which is absolutely brutal. And I think I told you um, the the one public official he's in favor of is Vladimir Putin. Now, why? Why is he in favor of Putin? Because he's passed anti-gay laws. You're gonna go support this guy's agenda by attending his prayer breakfast, as I've seen all these schmuck Democrats do my entire life. Will you, for God's sake, read something? We already broke the stories. This is now the, the, the latest in our exclusives, and this shows who's funding it. Is anybody gonna really argue that Franklin Graham is nonpartisan, and right. we're just going to pray with him and hold hands in a way that doesn't hurt? The LGBT community, the Muslim community, or a thousand other communities. You can't make that claim with a straight face. Any Democrat that continues to go is basically saying, I secretly don't like gay people or Muslims either. And I get to pretend that I do while actually going and holding hands with these guys and giving them credibility that they use in America and abroad to make sure they pass anti gay laws and discriminate in a horrible way. I love that we broke these stories. And I don't think any Democrat should ever go to that event again. All right, well, let's move on to some money laundering that's taking place here in the United States. And the reason why it can take place is because we have incredibly laxed regulations on real estate money laundering. So, a new report from Global Financial Integrity shows that billions of dollars a year are laundered in the United States through US real estate. And laxed regulations allow for it to happen completely unchecked. Now, researchers from the Global Financial Integrity Organization said at a minimum, $2.3 billion has been laundered through real estate over the last five years. And given that GFI only studied cases already reported or adjudicated, it ventured that the total value of property purchased with laundered money is even more staggering. And that certainly does not surprise me. This is one of the issues that I've been paying a lot of attention to because there's a lot of foreign investment in US real estate. Now, whenever you push back against it, people think that there's like some bigoted agenda, but no. Oftentimes, what you'll see, especially in these all cash purchases in US real estate that, you know, foreigners do not want to actually live in is Money laundering, it happens all the time and it happens in a lot of big cities. But now we're learning that it's also happening in small towns as well. So a United Nations agency in 2020 pegged the annual amount of money laundered worldwide at 800 billion or between two and 5% of the global gross domestic product. Now, the recently released Pandora papers also shed light on just how widespread money laundering really is and how the United States is really the top destination for dirty money. Watch. We're looking at about 12 million documents from 14 different service providers. These are law firms, um, firms that set up secret offshore accounts for people in multiple jurisdictions. The British Virgin Islands, Belize, Samoa. These documents for the very first time is actually showing the US as a tax haven itself. We're talking about some of the most famous people in the world that are in these documents, presidents, Prime Ministers, Government Ministers, the King of Jordan, a number of very high profile Russian clients, people that are very close to Vladimir Putin. We're seeing them buying real estate, we're seeing them you know, trading in shares, using offshore companies. They're buying houses, cars, artworks. I guess it mostly demonstrates that the people that could end the secrecy of offshore, could end what's going on, are themselves benefiting from it. So there's no incentive for them to end it. Now, there are some money laundering laws in the United States, right? But even the laws that exist are pretty weak. When it comes to real estate though, there are fewer money laundering laws involved, which is why Biden has decided to do a little bit, but it certainly doesn't go far enough. So Biden is urging the Treasury Department to revoke the regulatory exemption for real estate agents who are not currently required to identify their ultimate clients or to report suspicious activity. Remember, there's a lot of this money laundering happening, all of this real estate being purchased through shell companies. Now, the United States is the only major economic member of the G7 that does not impose anti money laundering rules on real estate professionals. I've got more details for you in just a Second, but Jenk, you know that this really grinds my gears. Yeah, of course. Well, it should bother all of us for a number of reasons. One, of course, it's illegal, and if our government isn't doing anything about it, 
uh, it's outrageous and uh, and of course it helps the wealthy, but specifically wealthy criminals that are looking to steal money from their home countries and bring it over here to hide it here. Uh, in fact, by the way, Trump Tower was a huge place where the Russian mafia would hide, uh, launder their money. Uh, there was at least 13 p uh, people that were publicly linked to the Russian mafia that bought uh, apartments in Trump Tower. Uh, there was a guy who came all the way back in 1984, Trump's been doing this forever, with literally $3 in his pocket and somehow bought $6 million worth of condos from Trump. Hmm. Okay. Weird. Huh. I, I wonder if he was connected to Russian oligarchs, even all the way back then. I mean, can you imagine now the Russian oligarchs, of course, run the place in, 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 the, in Russia. And, uh, and so there's a bunch of criminals that, that funnel their money through here. A guy like Trump says, well, they're buying my apartments. What do I care if they're laundering it? Actually, since you mentioned Trump, I looked further into the story because obviously that that Trump angle is an interesting one, especially considering the fact that many of those purchases were for properties that were valued far lower than what the money launderers had purchased them for, right? So, like they spent millions more than they needed to on a property that was valued as at millions less. But I also found out that in one of the National Defense Authorization Act bills, there was a provision in there. It was a bipartisan provision that had some laws, like some regulations in regard to money laundering in US real estate. And remember, Trump really made a point to veto that bill. Yeah. And so that that provision, I didn't see any reporting on that provision until recently. Yeah, in fact, that's mentioned in these stories about how the Trump years, they took whatever restrictions that were in place out. Why? Because the president was a well known money launderer. He didn't want provisions against money laundering in there. Look, if you're unclear about, wait, why would they pay Trump more for his properties than they're worth? Sometimes by a lot. Because if you stole, let me make up a number, $10 million. You stole it, you didn't earn it anyway, right? You've gotta pay a certain amount to the person that's cleaning the money for you. So they don't ask questions and they don't report you to the authorities as they're supposed to. So Trump would never report them to the authorities. You give him $10 million when the apartments are only worth eight or six. Oh, he's gonna take that money real quick. And he ain't ever gonna report you to the authorities even if you got no money in your pocket. And so those Russian mafia guys in the old Soviet Union then turned into Russian oligarchs in Putin's Russia. And look at the guys, the other two reasons why you should be furious about the story is all of these international criminals come to America because they think America's lawless. Yeah. If, if you're rich, you can do anything in America. Oh, The poor and the middle class, they got no chance, totally. right? Totally, yep. But if you're rich, America will let you get away with anything. There's no laws there at all for the rich. And so. And then the last part of it is they buy all the homes, and that actually does trickle down, right? Whether they're buying in a bad way, <laughs> yeah. It, whether they're buying expensive homes or now they're buying middle class homes because they want to hide uh, their assets even better. Well, what does that do? It drives up home prices because now they've reduced the supply, they've increased the demand, and they're willing to pay higher than market value because they're trying to. Clean up their dirty money. Bingo. So now we all have to pay more. That's right. Because criminals like Donald Trump thought, hey, I'm gonna make more money. Suckers that are in the middle class, if they get hurt by it, what do I care? They're suckers and losers in Trump parlance. That's exactly right. So in it just it hurts in two different ways. Number one, the bad guys get away with the bad behavior, right? Because we're not just talking about Russian oligarchs. We're also talking about drug traffickers. We're talking about uh, child sex traffickers. We're talking about the worst people on the planet easily laundering their money in the United States. And members of Congress know it, obviously the executive branch knows it. They're not doing enough about it. In fact, in regard to uh, what Biden proposed, it doesn't go nearly enough. I'm gonna go to the last graphic here. Uh, the Congressional Transparency Act provides a virtual GPS for launderers to legally avoid its reach. No registration with the database is required for companies that have more than 20 full-time uh, employees, uh, more than 5 million in gross receipts or Sales and operate at a physical U.S. location. Why are we, why are we offering carve-outs to money launderers? Why, right now? That's that's a 
That's the Congressional Transparency Act. But in regard to what Biden is proposing, that doesn't go far enough either, right? There's always a loophole, there's always a carve out. And you gotta ask, why are these people who are supposed to be representing us, who are supposed to be keeping us safe, right? Who are supposed to be representing our best interests, why are they going out of their way to propose weak sauce legislation or regulations that offer loopholes and carve outs to the worst people on the planet? Why? I, I can tell you, mystery solved rather easily. So this is bipartisan, by the way. Trump just happens to be a flagrant and flamboyant example of the money laundering in America and then gutting the money laundering laws when he's in charge. But Democrats do it too. So uh, the guy who is the clearest example is Andrew Cuomo. When he was governor of New York, and we reported this for you guys years ago. And that was one of the few good stories the New York Times did about him. They showed how he gutted the laws that would have the realtors show you who's actually buying the properties. There's tons of empty properties all over New York, and especially in Manhattan. It's criminals from all across the world. And guys, don't get obsessed with Trump or Russia. As you saw, there's the leader of Kenya, leader of the Czech Republic. It's it's from everywhere. Oh, there's Turkish mafia in there. You name it, it's in there. Let me give you one specific example. In one instance, a hundred million dollars embezzled from Kuwait's Department of Defense was used to buy a 157 acre. Acre, 157 acre Beverly Hills property known as the mountain. So it's all sorts of people all over the world, okay? Yes. Continue. And, and as Trump said about uh, the people from the Gulf, including Kuwait and the Saudis, he said, they pay me 30, 40 million dollars an apartment. Why wouldn't I like them? He's not gonna ask questions, but back to Cuomo. So Cuomo gutted the laws, let them cheat. Now you're, why? Why would a Democrat let them cheat? Because his top donors were real estate. Interest. So when we, guys, bribery is the source of all corruption in America. When we allowed legalized bribery, where the Supreme Court said you can give campaign donations, unlimited campaign donations to politicians, they all became criminals. Not overnight, but I explained in my book, justicecoverbook.com, you can get it there, how it happened, exactly how it happened. And Slowly, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party was overnight. The Democratic Party took a little while. And eventually they were like, well, do you want the money or don't you want the money? The ones with the money win, the ones without the money don't win. So they have all started taking bribes because they became legal. And after they became legal, guys like Andrew Cuomo are like, what am I, a sucker? I want more power. And so he got reelected, reelected, reelected. The media almost never challenged him except that one story. And, and, uh, and he had his own uh, corruption panel. Committee, and he shut it down when they started investigating what? His own real estate donors. I swear to God, you could look it up, okay? Because that's a ton of money in real estate. Mm -hmm. So they're funneling a small proceeds to the corrupt politicians so they can get away with all these crimes. It's disgusting. All right, well, we gotta take a break. When we come back though, ProPublica has an in-depth piece regarding a judge in Tennessee who seems to get a kick out of imprisoning as many children as possible. We've got that story and more when we come back. All right, back on TYT, Jank and Anna with you guys. By the way, already we got a hype train on Twitch mm. because of the pocket chip challenge. Choo you guys, choo. I'm thinking of cheating, man. Not that I wouldn't eat it. If I say I'm gonna eat it, I'm definitely gonna eat it. But I wanna crank up the number to 7,000 subscribers or something. I will see if I'm allowed to cheat. But you, they're it's already- Turkish, you, you like spicy food, you can mm, handle it. Not me, I don't like it at all. Really, <laughs> so, you yeah. don't like spicy? No. I, I don't like spicy food at all. Oh. So that pocket chip is gonna do serious damage. Okay, so anyways, hmm. I guess keep it going. That's why I said no when I was asked if I'd participate in that. <laughs> See? I know myself, okay? I know Whereas myself. Whereas I'm <laughs> the one ready to throw myself on a pocket chip even if I ate. <laughs> okay, all right, all go right. ahead, Casper. A new report by Pope, a new report by ProPublica finds that the juvenile court judge in Rutherford County, Tennessee, seems to get a kick out of imprisoning children for crimes that don't even exist, and also for things like truancy and swearing. So this judge, Judge Donna Scott Davenport, actually also broke the law herself several times in the way she conducts her own job. In fact, in 1998, Judge Donna Scott Davenport became a juvenile court referee akin to a judge. The following year, Rutherford County violated federal law 
191 times by keeping kids locked up too long. So not only is she imprisoning children for nonsensical reasons, she's also keeping them in in these juvenile detention centers, which are basically prisons for kids, longer than she's allowed to under Tennessee state law. Now, here's an instance from 2016 that actually did grab national attention, but unfortunately not enough attention to ensure that she's no longer a judge. So three police officers went to Hobgood Elementary School in Tennessee and arrested four black girls. One girl fell to her knees, another threw up. Police handcuffed the youngest, an eight year old with pigtails. Their supposed crime, watching some boys fight and not stopping them. So in that case, police ended up arresting 11 kids in total using a charge called criminal responsibility. The district attorney for Rutherford County confirmed to the police investigators that there's no such crime as criminal responsibility. So luckily that case later was settled for almost $400,000. But keep in mind, there were innocent children sent to a juvenile detention center, arrested, handcuffed and sent to a juvenile detention center for failing to stop two boys from fighting. Insane, absolutely insane. But the story gets crazier, Jink. Yeah, so this story is just horrific in 18 different ways. And even some of the cops that were arresting the kids started crying because they're like, why, why are we doing this? And it was a couple of black cops who one of them just actively said, we should not be arresting these kids. And the white cop basically steamrolled them and said no, and he put the kids in handcuffs. But, but it's thousands of cases like this. So they, you're gonna be shocked to find out they mainly did it to poor black kids, okay? But they did it to poor white kids too. Uh, and but black kids more disproportionately. But but I, this one uh, white kid, he's got bipolar disorder. They put him in there, and then they put him in solitary confinement. Oh my God! And and then afterwards, his medication stops working. It's not even like then he he had suicidal thoughts before. He tried to take his own life a couple of times afterwards. Solitary confinement is torture. The lowest level of solitary confinement they had for these kids was twelve hours a day. And, and at level eight, it was indefinite solitary confinement. And they would even board up the windows so they couldn't see the other kids. This is disgusting what they're doing to people. And I, look, I, I've told you guys this a lot of times. When we were kids, we used to fight all the time. I grew up in New Jersey, it was a fairly regular occurrence, right? If the kids who fought were arrested, we'd all, all of our lives would have been ruined. We all would have had criminal records. God knows what would happen to us in juvenile detention. But now they're arresting the kids. Who are watching the fight? One of the girls was trying to stop the fight. They arrested her anyway. One of the girls wasn't anywhere near the fight. They arrested her anyway. It is not their responsibility to intervene and stop the fight. It is not. They're kids. They're freaking kids. They're kids. Period. But this woman, this judge, is an advocate for detaining kids for the most insane, nonsensical reasons. For something as simple as cursing. She literally has a basket full of belts in the courtroom. So if someone shows up in her courtroom without wearing a belt to keep their pants up, she forces them to wear a belt. Insane, psycho, psychopath. This woman failed the bar four times for good reason, clearly. She is not fit to be a judge. In fact, why don't we learn a little more about Judge Davenport? Let's give you a little taste of who she is. Watch this video. I mean, being detained at our facility is not a picnic at all. It's not supposed to be. It's a consequence for an action. I've locked up one seven-year-old in 13 years, and that was a heartbreak. But eight and nine-year-olds and odor are very common now. Uh, she also, as I mentioned earlier, failed the bar four times. Uh, and there's more details on that in this next clip. When did you first take the bar? I waited to 87, I believe, a year after I graduated to Okay. Um, and then I, I guess, didn't, didn't pass that. No. Um, um, were there any other attempts in between that first yes. time? How many times did you do I passed on the fifth time. 
She passed on the fifth time, nine years after she graduated from law school. And by the way, she locks up more kids than any other county in Tennessee. Let me give you the details on that. Under Davenport, Rutherford County locked up a staggering 48% of children whose cases were referred to juvenile court. The statewide average is just 5%. Take a look at this visual that compares Rutherford County to all the other counties in Tennessee. And you see that giant you know, number, 48% compared to much smaller numbers in other counties. And by law, by the way, children held for such minor acts as truancy were to appear before a judge within 24 hours and be released no more than a day after that. I'm sorry, no one should be imprisoned for truancy, no one, okay? It's insane. It's I'm sorry, especially now when the economic situation is so dire for so many parents. You got two parents busting their butts, sometimes one parent busting his or her butt, working nonstop in several different jobs, part time jobs, just to make ends meet. Sometimes kids end up being truant as a result of that. Parents have no support. To then lock kids up for truancy is ridiculous. But let me give you more of what's been going on. So the newspaper intervened, I'm sorry, the newspaper interviewed Davenport, who estimated half of those. Uh, violations occurred because a kid, uh, kid had cursed uh, her or someone else. For cursing, she said, she typically sentenced kids to two to 10 days in jail. Okay, hold on. Now, this is really important. Now, I don't care that she failed the bar, uh, but she poses as someone who's high and mighty. She has a radio show that she does every week where she brags about how many kids she locks up, okay? It's disgusting. And because she's such an important uh, you know, judicial figure in this uh, uh, county. But wait a minute, you're not allowed by law to lock up kids for truancy past 24 hours. She does it for sometimes up to 10 days, as Anna just told you. Why? Because they disrespected her and cussed at her. Yeah, in fact, she said that's this. illegal, but that's illegal. No, you can't pretend to be a great judge while bragging about things that are illegal. So she brags about breaking the law. In fact, in response to that, she said, was I in violation? Heck yes, but am I going to allow a child to cuss anyone out? Heck no. Where are the free speech activists? Where are the lovers of American freedom? Is this freedom? Is this freedom? I wanna know, is this the land of the free? Locking up kids for cursing, really? That's the land of the free. And guys, and of course, there's a financial motive involved, which I'll get to. Yeah, so you can say, hey, look, we want good decorum in court. No problem, okay? And there's different ways that you can enforce that. 10 days in prison for a child when it is against the law. How about we imprison you for breaking the law? Oh, no, 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 I get it. The law is only for poor people and for little kids that you can take your vengeance out on. I don't know what her psychological issues are, but she loves locking up those kids. But if you said to her, how about we lock you up for breaking the law? Which you brazenly admitted, right? You'd be like, oh, how dare you? I'm an important judicial figure in this county. She says she's the mother of the county. Come what on. kind of a sick mom would do this to her? She said, it's 10 times the rate of the rest of Tennessee. It's not like we're talking about a super progressive place. And and so, of course, there's a financial issue here. But speaking of belts, one of the officers, one of the guards at this horrific detention center used a belt on one of the kids. Yep. And this judge highly recommended her. Yep. So, but she's the moral one. She's the moral one. So, uh, Final part of this, I want to talk a little bit about the detention center itself, because there are some interesting details there. So first off, she has decided to participate in this like cheery and also incredibly disgusting advertisement for the detention center. She refers to it as state of the art, like bragging about it. Let's take a look at that. Built in 2008, the Rutherford County Juvenile Detention Center is a 43,094 square foot facility that is located in the heart of Tennessee. Just minutes from Interstate 24 in Murfreesboro, the center is easily accessible with plenty of lodging and restaurant choices to choose from. Location check, facility check, 
Employees, check. Programs, check. With all this going for us, there's no question why we have contracts for the detention of juvenile detainees. Oh, wow, wow, so my kid can get imprisoned for cursing or for truancy? And if they happen to end up in this juvenile detention center, there's an unlimited restaurant options in the area? What the hell was that? That was a literal ad for Rutherford County, we'll lock your kids up. And guess what? They get paid for it, Mm -hmm. so that's why they do it. The county gets $175 a day for each kid they jail. When she first started the the budget for juvenile detention in that county was a little under a million dollars. It's now $3.69 million because they keep arresting more and more kids. 48% of the kids that go in front of her, she's like, lock them up, lock them up, $175 a day. Hey, hello, Tennessee, we'll we'll arrest all your kids. White, black, poor, it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter, you can't be rich because you the rich are moral, the judges are moral. But your poor kids, they're immoral. The kids as they're arresting them, there's stories they're vomiting all over the floor. They're so scared, they don't know what to do with it. They're you know, elementary school they're, kids. They're, she bragged you saw it in the table about arresting eight or nine year olds. Have you ever had an eight or nine year old? Arresting them for watching a fight? <laughs> I mean, I told you the members in one of the bonus episodes about the Buford fight. The whole junior high school watched me fight Buford, right? They would have to lock up the entire junior high school. She would have probably loved it. She, she would have that money. She and she would have gone and bragged about, uh, bragged about it on the radio. I locked up the whole junior high. We made so much money that day, right? And so as the stories of the kids though was, was so heartbreaking. They're handcuffing the kids. People are screaming, don't handcuff them, don't handcuff them. The principal's weeping, some of the cops are weeping. The kids are absolutely hysterical. Why is she not fired? Why is she not fired? She works today. She needs to go, period, okay? I mean, the case that we're talking about was in 2016. It grabbed national headlines. Why is she employed as a judge? Making these decisions, and by the way, when we're talking about juvenile courts, we're not talking about the type of situation you'd run into with a jury. She gets to make the decisions unilaterally. She said, I should be paid 12 times as much because I act as the jury too. <laughs> you know, she gets like $176,000 a year for locking those kids up, that's her salary. She's up for reelection, and if she wins, she's gonna get another eight years. By that time, she might lock all your kids up in Tennessee. She keeps uh, she keeps getting reelected because she's unopposed. No one's running against her, right? In fact, there was one situation where someone did run against her, and then it turned out that that person was abusing children. <laughs> and then after that, she didn't have to worry about uh, you know running for reelection because no one ran against her. I'm just gonna say one last thing here. Look, we're trying to protect the kids of Tennessee. Do you care about your kids or don't you care about your kids? And so these people that come in and pretend to be the most moral. Now, some of the best people I've ever met are religious people, Christians, Muslims, Jews, etc. That don't go around bragging about it. They just go do amazing work and they don't tell anybody. And the community knows them, the folks that they're helping knows them. But the worst people I've ever met are the ones that are going around moralizing in public. They're bragging to everybody how, about how moral they are. They are the most immoral people almost every time. And here she is bragging every day, every week on the radio. I lock eight, nine year olds up, I lock them all up and I get paid for it. It's disgusting. She's one of the least moral people I have ever heard about. All right, well, we gotta take a break. But when we come back, my favorite Charlie Kirk video of all time. You do not want to miss it. It's a lot of fun. We'll be back. Sexual anarchy. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Young Turks. Support our work, listen ad free, access members only bonus content and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, Jank Uger, and I'll see you soon.